So yeah, so thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, I am studying mate selection. I had a chance to chat with a few people here before this talk, and uh, I'm really excited. So there's all sorts of really neat things to talk about uh, with mate selection, but I'm specifically going to be talking about the female mate selection and the maternal effects aspect in the Canadian guppy. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's get started. So first, the main, main kind of topics I'll be talking about is female mate choice. I'll explain what female mate choice is. From there, I'll move to kind of five hypotheses around female mate choice, and then causes and sources of variation in how females choose their mates. Then I'll move on to the costs of female mate choice, because like everything else, and most things in, in zoology and, and biology in general, there's always a trade-off between the costs, right? Costs and benefits. From there, I'll then talk about the effects of predation, and uh, and once uh, and, and that's really where my interest lies in how pre like pred predators and predation affect mate selection. And then I'll talk about uh, about two of the experiments that I ran uh, back home. And then, time permitting, I'll talk a little bit about uh, about maternal effects as well. One of the other experiments I was running there. Um, now, just to kind of explain why I'm here, so I'm actually here on a fellowship with the Shastri Institute, and um, that's the Shastri Indo Canadian Institute. And, uh, the fellowship. It's actually, there's Canadian fellowship and the Indian fellowship, and it allows movement of scientists and academics from one country to the other um, for learning, for giving talks, for, for essentially exchange of information. So I'm more than happy to talk about that as well, so I can answer questions on that. Questions about life in Canada, questions about this year. I really, you know, don't hesitate. I, I love, love it. Give me questions about anything in life. Tell you what I had for breakfast, too. So female mate choice. What is female mate choice? So female mate choice is essentially the idea behind, well, why we have all these amazing, beautiful structures in the world that we see. So whether that be a peacock, actually, I visited the library and there was a, a peacock sitting on top of the, on one of the trees right in front of the library right here, which was really, really interesting. Because um, I did not know peacocks could fly that high, wow. Um, so peacocks and their tails are a common example of, of uh, a secondary sexual characteristic. These are characteristics that are chosen by females, and we see this directional selection occurring over time, and why we see these kind of traits. So whether that be the dewlap and a no lizard, whether that be a peacock jumping spider, or we can even see this in a human example if you go to a nightclub or something like that. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the human example a little later. So the idea behind mate selection, it has kind of a colored or very interesting history. It involves three of the most important scientists that have really been out there. So whether you're looking at Charles Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace right over there on the right, and then Ronald Fisher. So Charles Darwin believed that the reason for those traits that we saw earlier was really just a, an aesthetic thing, that animals naturally, they, they, there was an aesthetic uh, kind of love for color. Then Alfred Russell Wallace, he had a complete opposite idea. His idea here was that there is no, you know, humans are the only ones that have an aesthetic sense, that it is purely selection that's taking place, that there's no, no actual uh, choices being made. It was Ronald Fisher that really came up with this idea of mate selection, the fact that this is being cho chosen for because this coloration or these, these movements and whatever these traits might be are actually being selected for uh, because of their, their, the fitness benefit that they have for the, the offspring, so the, the genetic component. And this led to five different major hypotheses forming. The first one was the sexy sun hypothesis. So the sexy sun hypothesis talks about how females will choose mates with traits because their male offspring will be selected for. So essentially the daughters of that coupling will naturally like that trait and the sons will have that trait. And so for example, the daughters will keep choosing that those, those sons and the sons will maintain those, those traits. And this leads to something called a Fisherian runaway hypothesis or process rather, uh, where you have sexual dimorphism forming. So why we have males and females looking very different in certain species, and generally you can see that mate selection occurring in those those species. And uh, this so this is the, the one of the major ones, the sex and sun hypothesis. And the second one, and, and just to really actually really make sure to, to iterate the fact that this is an indirect effect. This is an effect that's taking place on the offspring, not on the main on, on the individuals that are actually copulating or making a, making their offspring. The second one was the good genes hypothesis, and this is the direct effect. Now, this, what this talks about is how there are honest signals. I just mentioned honest signals a little bit earlier, but uh, how there are honest signals for, for genes, uh, for, for the underlying genes behind these structures. So one example 
is that you know, if, if someone has big muscles, chances are they're quite strong. It's, a, it's an honest signal for strength. We, as humans, we like to sometimes hide those. And so we can kind of, to get a little bit about honest signals, makeup, shoes, clothing, things like that, they sometimes, they're, they're made to make us look healthier than we might actually be. Um, you, you might want to you know, put some blush to add some, some or rouge or different makeup, things like that, to kind of really make those colors pop, make you look healthy. Uh, really, the idea behind that is to essentially give you an underline. Yeah, absolutely. So, your previous one and this theory, yeah. when they go for dating, do they see any of these things? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, was, I was telling the master students earlier, I was saying, you're going to learn one of two things. You're going to either find out why fish are interesting, right, on their selection criteria, or you're going to learn how to choose a mate, you know. So, I'm really here as a dating coach, actually. But they don't have way, they don't have way to find out what kind of genes should be there. Only look wise, you can. Yes, part of it. Oh, that's well. That's of course a major, major underlying thing. Well, you're saying the human side, or from the I guess from well, all human sides, side. but yeah, from the human side. Well, I mean, the idea being that over time, the selection has has happened that we're naturally drawn to these characteristics, which are tied to the, the genetics of the individual. So, for example, they might be um, you know, like the, the muscle example would be strength. Now, historically, that we might have a selection towards that strength simply because. That was uh, the ones that were not strong, they didn't leave. But I think many times it happens because they spend too much time together working close by, so their attraction happens. Of course, yeah, that's another. Well, so that actually I'm going to get into a little bit later where we're talking about variation in, in uh, mate choice and how actually that exact thing can happen. Why, why you might have individuals that are working in proximity uh, end up uh, mating. <laughs> so there, this, this is a direct effect. So the, the, uh, the good genes hypothesis, there's, a, there's a, the, the individuals actually choosing the, the mate based on their uh, on the characteristics they're showing based on the underlying genes. The next one is the sensory bias hypothesis. And the sensory bias hypothesis is saying that essentially females, they might like something specifically completely unrelated to the genes that are, uh, that are existing. So for example, one might see uh, maybe, maybe this group of female peacocks happens to like the color blue. Well, the males themselves, they might not be, might not be that blue is somehow indicative of better health, although in some cases it is. They might just naturally end up having more blue because the females will choose for individuals that are more blue because they just like the color blue. Maybe the color blue reminds them of some kind of food that they find in nature and they tend to gravitate toward that color. So they're kind of hijacking this, uh, this preference for certain type of characteristics the females have. This doesn't just have to be sight or color, it can be smells, when you're looking at pheromones, they can be sounds as well, when you're looking at mimicking calls, things like that. So a sensory bias hypothesis is essentially a selection for a trait and the male's kind of saying, oh, well, girls like that, so I better kind of start doing a bit more of, of this thing that they like. Hey, they like blue, I'm gonna start wearing blue everywhere. Um, <laughs> so it's a, that's a sensory bias hypothesis. The fourth hypothesis is the compatibility hypothesis. And this, there's something called the major is the compatibility complex in humans, MHC. And what the MHC essentially is, is it's, it's, a, it's a number of genes that are coding for essentially our, our uh, immune system, or a component of our immune system. And the, the idea behind the MHC is, let's say two individuals will have two different types of this, this, uh, this kind of complex. Some will have their different variants. And it's ideal for the offspring to have, a, have two parents with different MHCs, the reason being that once you put them together, that the combined effect of these, the, the both parents' <coughs> MHCs will wind up with a, an offspring which is much better able to handle the, uh, the stresses that, that come to diseases and things like that. So one of the ways that they might be selecting for a mate is through this compatibility, this MHC. And, and there's a number of different, I mean, MHC is the human example, but there are other examples in other species as well. And the last hypothesis is the handicap hypothesis. So some of you might have heard this earlier. The idea is the, uh, that males will actually develop traits because it shows that they can handicap themselves um, and still be fit. So really, it's not that they're you know, cutting their own leg off and saying, hey, look, I'm walking on you know, one leg, but you know, I can still survive. It's more a, a common example is the peacock. So the peacock has a very large tail. And the tail itself, it, it, it holds it down. You, know, you don't want to be in an area where there's leopards and tigers and things that want to eat you when you have this big tail sitting on your back dragging you every time you're trying to get around, even if you're able to fly all the way up there. Um, and it's, it's proportional to the overall fitness. An extremely fit peacock is able to maintain a very long tail simply because 
they're they're fit enough that they can carry that weight. An unfit peacock cannot do that because by keeping that very long, heavy tail, uh, proportional to its fitness level, it will hold it down and let it get eaten. So that's the handicap hypothesis. So the females will clue in the fact that they have this really large trait and the male is still able to survive. But, of course, there's variation in all things in life. Variation is the spice of life, as they say. And so there are two major types of variation, the choosiness and the preference of the females. And this gets into what you were saying, actually, about why that proximity can have these effects. Sometimes, you know, there's some so choosiness is a big, a big part of it. So the amount of effort that an individual is ready to actually invest into something. So as a, a female might not want to put that much energy, or they might not be having enough food. It requires a lot of energy, a lot of time to find a mate that fits all the different criteria that they're looking for. So maybe it's just easier to go with the thing that's right next to you. The other side of things is the preference. So the female preference for certain characteristics might differ between individuals. For example, the color blue preference versus the color pink preference. Neither could be linked to an actual specific genetic difference between those two colors, but just individual variation of preference for those colors can lead to those kind of, uh, those kind of choices being made. So that choosiness and the preference is what can start to add some variation. And this variation can occur between populations, can occur within populations, but also can be occur within an individual. And this within individual variation is what we're looking at when we're talking about animal behavior. So whether that be the time of the day, whether that involves being hungry versus not hungry, you know, the way that hormones are regulating various things, that can change the behavior within an individual, say within a given period of time. So we're talking about circadian rhythms, for example, that's within individual variation. Now, there are a number of factors that do play into this. There are genetic factors. Now, this is a really, really cool example. Uh, this is actually, these are two males of a, of a species of butterfly. The females actually occur in two different morphs. And one is a white morph, one is a yellow morph. And they'll actually choose different males based on which morph they are. And this is very interesting because there's a genetic factor underlying their choice. So even though they're all still the same species, there is this, this change. And what we can see and what we propose is eventually this might actually lead to speciation occurring. So that's one example of how speciation occurring. It's a little side tangent. But there are possible genetic factors that underlie this happening. The next are social factors. So social factors include interactions between males. These are one of my favorite animals on the planet. Their behavior is so cool. You might have heard of them. They're, essentially what they do is these male birds, what they'll do is they'll line up and you'll have four of these or four or five of these birds line up in a row. And they'll all practice dancing. They'll actually, in fact, in fact, practice dancing to other males. And once they've kind of got this little dance routine going on, they'll go and they'll find a female, they'll all go into a little row and they'll dance. And there'll be many of these dances taking place for let's say one or two females. The female will eventually just choose which one she, she prefers, which dance group, which boy band she wants to choose. But she'll only mate with one of the males, with the lead dancer. So the other males don't get anything out of it, presumably, they're just dancing. But that lead male in that group is the one that then passes on his genes. So those are interactions between males. Uh, there's also variability in the male phenotypes. These birds down here with their very long tail, there's an experience being done with their bower birds. Oh, no, sorry, not bower birds. They're, um, oh, I forgot the name, uh, long-tailed, sorry? Black long, uh, the black birds? Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the, the tail length, so they've actually cut the tail or glued another tail onto it to show how the length of the tail changes the female's choice. We look at female to female competition, that you'll see these razor bills, for example. Sometimes it just takes way too much energy to pursue that guy because, you know, there's three other females right to punch you in the face or heck your eyes out if you're this unfortunate bird. Uh, female made copying, that's a very interesting one. So you'll see that in especially lecking animals, so animals where you might find one male with a, a large harem of females. Re the reason being that it's a lot easier to choose, it takes a lot less energy and effort if you just choose the one that all the other females are, are choosing, and there's a lot less risk. So this way, because there's a risk component, I'll talk about that in a second, behind choosing a mate, the, uh, in lepping animals, these females, they can say, okay, well, if there's six females around that one male, chances are that one male is of good genetic background, so therefore I'll, I'll stick with this one as well. So that it reduces that cost required, or the energy, sorry, required to make that choice. The other thing is the operational sex ratio, so male to female ratio in a given population. If there's a ton of males and not a lot of females, 
it allows it to be a lot more choosy. But if it's skewed the other way around, where there's plenty of females and not a lot of males, the, the actual amount of choice or the, the, the choice required, it's, it's, uh, it shifts in the other direction. Lastly, there are environmental factors. So when we're talking about environmental factors, we are again talking about the time and energy cost that's required. So for example, sampling the sandy, rocky shore. You know, if we're looking at habitat degradation, that's a great example. When environments are changing, that changes the costs that are associated with find another mate. Uh, you can look at tear tree and resource quality. So for example, these fiddler crabs and their burrows, they'll, based on the, the burrows, the females will choose which male to go, go mate with. And, uh, and, and as well as, uh, sorry, signal detection discrimination. So actually, this is the one I really wanted to talk about when we're talking about conservation. The reason being is these frogs, uh, what we've seen is that the, uh, within captivity, their calls actually change versus their calls when they're in a uh, in, in, in natural population. And the way this shifts can be shifted through noise, uh, noise pollution, for example. So as Places are being urbanized, there's increased amounts of noise being formed. It's much harder for the females to hear that call, so they might even shift the way that they communicate with the female. Also, different pitches will get uh, filtered out, so certain pitches will go you know, further in a, in a less dense environment than others, so that can also shift the way that these, uh, these females are choosing a male. And then predation risk. So predation risk is this ever-present uh, Ever present reality for, for a lot of species, for pretty much all species out there. And so that is another factor that affects the, uh, the variation that we see in, uh, in female mate choice. And so these costs, what are the major costs of female mate choice? Well, we know mate choice is costly. We know everything is costly in this world. It's those trade offs as I mentioned earlier. There's a searching cost. It takes time and energy to find that male that is capable and, and good and has the best genes to continue on to the next generation. Uh, but there's also cost when it comes to assessment, so harassment and injury. Uh, we, and that again comes down to what I was saying earlier with the lecking species, why those species will tend to choose the ones that the other females will choose because the chance of them being harassed is much lower. You're in a group, there's many of you, and that male is probably not gonna harass you as much. There's actually, uh, and I can talk about that a little bit later, but that was an issue with one of my first earlier experiments when I was trying to do uh, some breeding experiments with cichlids, cichlids, convex cichlids, convex cichlids, sorry. Um, and essentially what was happening was that the, the males will be, they're, they're essentially bullies, and you have to put multiple females with the males so that they'll diverge this, his attention amongst many females. The problem though is that if she, he doesn't have enough space, he'll just keep going and actually wind up with a lot of dead female fish because the, the male was constantly harassing the females. The, uh, the, the last one, and disease and parasite transmission, that's another one, of course. Uh, the, more, the more individuals that another individual is in contact with, increases the possible risk of transmission of the disease. So there are these costs. Lastly, actually choosing an individual. So mating itself can be very risky. Generally, individuals will stop moving. If an individual stops moving, uh, you know, the actual process of copulation itself is, uh, is very risky. If, it, if the male is very brightly colored, as we've seen in some of these examples, it can make you a target for a lot of different uh, for predators, and we've seen this in Trinidadian guppies in the wild, where if uh, there's a male and a female guppy together, the, uh, the the predator will look for the male, but will actually go and eat the female, because the female is much larger, has a lot more nutrients, so it's very risky for her to be, uh, to be essentially in the process of mating with a very bright male, so that is another risk or cost that's associated with it. Uh, it's, yeah, so conspicuous courtship. Lost mating opportunities, so if you just take one male and that male turns out to be a dud, well, you've lost the, the opportunity to pass on your genes. And reduced male parental care is another problem. So males in general, you know, if it's if the male kind of just takes off or if the male dies, something happens, once again, it's another lost, lost opportunity. So you, the main idea is to make sure that your offspring survive to that next generation. That male parental care in some species is very important. Uh, coming back to convict cichlids, they're a very interesting species because they do exhibit parental care. And one uh, one of my breeding pairs, actually, in the earlier experiment, what happened was the female had essentially, it was kind of the other way around, she had stopped her parental care duties. The male, and it was like this overnight, the male just turned around and uh, he kicked her to the corner of the tank and made sure she stayed far away from the young and he assumed both the male and the female uh, behaviors. So it was very interesting to watch this, this male actually take on the full parental role. Now that can really only happen if the male is fit, and this can happen 
in the other way, so if the female is fit enough to take care of the offspring on her own, then she can, but in some situations, many situations, she can't, so that can be a huge cost if, uh, if it's just a single single uh, individual caring for all the offspring, especially in a species that exhibits parental care. And uh, so what, one thing we see is when we increase those costs, the females become less choosy. It ends up being essentially advantageous to just mate with those that are, say, closest to you or those that are less likely to be eaten. And so like I said, here with the, the guppies, we've seen this uh, with these high predation populations. When, when the risks are so high, they'll actually tend to mate with the duller looking fish because it means they won't be targeted. It means the ones that were mating with the pretty fish got targeted by the predators and now they're all eaten. So all that's left are the, the, the dull males, and so the females will, over time, the, the ones that were choosing the dull males will have been selected for, and will be left with uh, more dull males in that population. And uh, yeah, so that's like you do that initial predation, initial predation on the bright males. And so predation and mate choice, it's a very, very interesting concept. It, it comes down to why, uh, well, what, like I said, the major costs associated with uh, with choosing a mate. And this variation in, uh, in amnion risk predation can affect the behaviors in a number of different ways. So we see alteration of behaviors where, for example, that female might change the way that she chooses a, a mate. We'll see a change, a complete loss of some of these behaviors. So for example, they might not be choosing for some certain characteristics at all. And we'll also see a reversal in some of these so for example, when you move fish from a high predation to a low predation population and vice versa, we might actually see these behaviors from, from the area that was previously come back when it goes back to these type of, uh, type of environments. And there's different ways they can judge that environment, and I'll talk about that when I'm talking about my experiment a little bit. So some of the costs, of course, with predation include direct consumptive effects, being eaten. <laughs> In other words, another terminology for being eaten. No one wants to be eaten. Um, and there's two reasons this is a problem. One, you yourself can get eaten, but the other thing too is if you choose a very bright, pretty, conspicuous male, well, your offspring are also more likely to be eaten as well. And so that there's a kind of a twofold problem with with, uh, with predation when it comes to the direct effects. But the other side of things are the non-consumptive or indirect effects. And we see that when we're looking at some frogs and, and uh, possums. And these are actually, these guys aren't dead. They're just fading it. They're pretending to be dead. Um, but this leads to, this behavioral change that we see, it leads to changes in, um, well, in that, that meeting. I mean, the more time you spend playing dead, the less time you have to mate, right? The less time you have to go get food. And these behavioral changes to the individual due to predation can affect a lot of things, including, and most of all, the fitness of the individual. This is where natural selection comes in. So natural selection should favor individuals that are pretty good at assessing how risky that environment is. And that's what I was saying earlier when we were talking about how these females will, over time, they'll, they'll be able to assess the, the environment that they're in and shift that behavior accordingly. So if you're this, this dog here, it's, it's not a good idea to constantly, if you're afraid of this little guy here, it's probably not, uh, you know, not advantageous in the long term. But, uh, but over time, of course, hopefully he will learn, for example, that he's not this little guy on a threat. Um, but if he doesn't, well, he's at the gene pool. And so that's where natural selection will help uh, kind of help with one, the modification of those behaviors, but also in, uh, in making sure that there, there are mechanisms to assess the predation risk in a given environment. Now, there are two major ways that fish do this. Fish will do this through alarm cues and disturbance cues. These are public, generally available cues, your cues in the water. And the first one, disturbance cues, it's essentially an um, extremely general cue in the sense that uh, it doesn't really tell the, the receiver what, what's going on. It's essentially if I just came up here and just peed myself. You know that, okay, something is weird. That guy up there, he's just peed himself. Maybe there's something to be afraid of, maybe not, but I'll still be cautious, right? So it tells you in advance, maybe you should be a little bit worried about that area. It's most likely a nitrogenous waste like urea or urine. And uh, it is released across both the gill epithelia, but it's also released through uh, through their, uh, well, their urinating, essentially. Um, and so, uh, that's the best way to put it. And it's an early warning signal. Now, this is contrasted with alarm cues. And alarm cues is the main focus of actually our lab and the research that we do. Alarm cues were originally proposed in 1941 as stretched off. And they're, uh, they're an actually energetically expensive cue that's stored under the cells of fish. And the original purpose was actually to mitigate against the 
parasitic and fungal infections, as well as a, a method of protecting against UV radiation. But it's been co-opted in a way that fish can then understand more about their environment, the predation risk that's exposed. So anytime that there's a cut, if a fish is eaten or bitten or injured, a more risk, which really occurs in very risky environments, this chemical will be released, and this has a lot of information inside it. In that chemical, another fish can see how big that fish was. They can see if that fish was related or not. They can say, okay, well, was this my cousin Sam, who, you know, seven feet tall? Well, maybe whatever just ate cousin Sam isn't going to affect me because I'm way shorter than cousin Sam, and I'm, you know, just we're just cousins. But was it my twin brother? Well, that might be a problem because whatever ate my twin brother will probably want to eat me too. So there's a lot of information. Now the other role of, uh, of alarm cues is that is the uh, or proposed role is the uh, aggregation of secondary predators. So essentially, if you're if you're this guy over here, and you get bitten by this guy, well, hopefully the chemical that's released here will actually attract this guy over here. So he'll come and eat this guy, and you can escape in the, in the process. So alarm cues are very interesting for a number of different reasons, again from the predation side. But I was curious, essentially looking into more on the mate selection side. This is this is how we changed the background predation risk. And so that brought me to my major experiment. So I want to see what those disturbance cues, those alarm cues do to mate selection. So if you have a really risky environment and the females think that <clears throat> they might be eaten at any minute, how that changed the way that they choose their mates. So I had three major kind of predictions. One of them was that they would select duller colored males, again, for the reason I, I mentioned earlier, that we have seen this in wild populations, this, this movement towards duller males and high predation populations. Uh, they might reduce their decision-making time. It's better to make a decision really quick. Maybe it's the one right next to you. Maybe it's you know the, the first male that you see because you just want to mate and get it over with and not put yourself at unnecessary risk. And also, for the same reason, spend less time moving between different males that are, that are around, so the sampling frequency. So you don't want to be out there sampling a lot when there might be something to come in, grab you, and, and eat you. So we're putting these Trinidadian guppies. So these, this right here, this is our uh, our male Trinidadian guppy. This is our female. You can see some, he's a little bit small. This, this is actually, the scale's a little bit off. He's a little bit further back. But, uh, but this guy right here is about uh, maybe half the size of the females, especially when the females are pregnant. Interesting thing with the females, they will get pregnant. They will maintain that pregnancy for their entire lives. And uh, once they're in an environment where they're getting birth, they will just keep going factories. They will just keep giving birth constantly. And they're live bears, so I see giving birth as opposed to laying eggs. Now, they choose based that these, uh, these females will choose based on the coloration, the behaviors. Um, and it's non resource based. So, again, like I was saying, they're just little factories of, of babies. And so they're really just interested in the sperm. They don't, there's no parental care in these fish, it's just mate, and that's it. And uh, the adults, the males, will pursue these females with different behaviors so we can actually quantify some of this behavior as well and make sure that it's the female mate choice that we're looking at. What I did was I set up six tanks, as you can see here, and uh, these, I put F1 generation, Trinity and Guppy, females, pregnant females. F1 generation means they're the first generation born in a lab setting, as opposed to wild-caught Trinity and Guppies that were fresh from Trinidad. Uh, put them in these tanks after about one day they, to get used to the new environment. They were then separated into two different groups or three different groups: so disturbance cues, alarm cues, alarm cues, and those that are given a distilled water control. And uh, from there, they uh, they also the, the ones that received the the cues, so the disturbance cue and the alarm cue, these different threat levels. They were also chased around with a little lure. The main reason for that was because we want to make sure that they don't lose that ability to identify that risky situation as a, a risky place. So the disturbance cue and the alarm cue essentially tells you, okay, there's something to be afraid of. The chasing with the lure tells them, okay, there's something actually chasing you. So they don't lose that over time. Because we have seen that they, they can lose that, that uh, their responses over time. But they realize that that alarm cue is not actually linked with any real risk. On day four, so after three days of treating them with disturbance cue or alarm cue or the control, they were moved individually into the central tanks here and put inside this plastic cone that you see on the side. On either side, there was a very pretty bright blue male, and on this side, there was a very dull male. So it did not have that rose white color, did not have the color blue. And so the, the female was essentially given a certain amount of time to uh, inside to get used to this tank. Upon which there, there were two barriers, and these barriers were removed from either side. So now she's in this tube, 
And she can see both side tanks. She can see there's a pretty male over there, and there's a dull male over there, but she can't get to them yet. She just she's given some time to assess the situation and see, okay, well, there's males around here. At which point, that cylinder was removed, and she was allowed to make her choice, and this is done over and over and over and over, and as we know in many research things, a lot of times. <laughs> Um, this was all recorded with a GoPro on this side as well as this side. I recorded on the two GoPros in order to both look at the female behavior, but I also have data on the male behavior. I haven't actually looked at the male behavior yet. It's kind of a side thing I might just play around with, but the main focus, of course, was the female mate selection. And so once uh, once she made these choices, there was a number of different, uh, the, the video was analyzed using a number of free software. It's a free behavioral software called Boris. And, um, it was, uh, the, the, there were also photographed to make sure to control for the colors and things like that, just to get an idea of the, what the pretty male's looking like, what were the dull male's looking like, and then look at their overall behavior. There were four major behaviors of female that I was interested in. They were the time until she made her first choice, so how long she waited to the center before quickly going to one of the males. Sampling frequency, so essentially how many times he was just checking those males. <laughs> The number of times she spent, or amount of time rather, she spent with a specific male, so what was her choice, who did she choose? And finally, the amount of time that she spent with both males. So essentially, I wanted to see, this is a measure of sexual activity, so essentially how much time she's spending with either of the males, regardless of what their actual color was. And so when I looked at the disturbance here, the differences in disturbance here, alarm you from the controls. I did see that at alarm queue, there was actually no significant difference. They didn't change their behaviors at all compared to controls. But when I was looking at the disturbance queue, I did see that their sampling frequency and their sexual activity were different. And what that, and in this case, actually, I, I don't have this graph here, but essentially it was uh, the sampling frequency and female sexual activity was reduced. So essentially what happened was they were a lot less, uh, they, they didn't want to be out in the open much. They wanted to just quickly find that male. In the disturbance queue, but not the alarm queue. And this was really, really interesting to me. The reason being that you would think that if you saw this in the disturbance queue, you'd see it with the alarm queue as well. But there's a few possible reasons that would not occur in that, that kind of predictable linear math manner. And that might be due to lost opportunities, as well as Weber's laws. So this is the idea with Weber's law, I'll start with Weber's law, that an individual, as the, as the threat or a specific signal increases, the ability for an individual to discriminate between choices can change based on that, and they can actually lower that ability to discriminate. So one possible possible reason for this is that with, the, with alarm queue, an extremely high risk situation compared to disturbance queue, it was very difficult to actually to, to choose between the males because she was just afraid, so she figured just choose something. So we didn't really see that difference. But with the disturbance queue, because it's risky but not as risky, she might have had she might have felt more comfortable making that choice. Similarly, with the lost opportunities, there's this idea that she could have also, again, with the alarm queue, just wanted to take off, whereas with the disturbance queue, be more likely to go in and spend more time foraging in the central chamber and things like that. So there's, there's, there's changes in the way that, essentially, that it's this lost opportunity cost, like I was mentioning earlier, there's a trade-off. This matters for a number of reasons. I mean, when we're looking at pure ecology, pure research, we want to know, well, why does this matter? Well, it tells a lot about the evolution of both well, secondary sexual characteristics, but also mate selection as a whole, whether that be the rate and direction of evolution through sexual selection, so how much these, these, the selection process, the sexual selection process has when we're looking at natural selection and sexual uh, selection over time. The uh, information on the evolutionary history, the genetic basis, so we're looking phylogeny of these, these species and how that speciation occurs, as I mentioned earlier on. So when we see the sexual selection occurring, whether we'll see these divergences over time based on behavioral differences on those individual, within those individuals. It'll also tell us a little bit about the, uh, the well, again, the evolution of secondary sexual characteristics, so why we see certain colorations of certain behaviors. And lastly, it also tells us about the robustness of those male traits, so whether or not those traits can be Remove whether or not they become more dull, whether they become more bright, whether or not what how strong those traits are, that actually tells us whether or not those traits are in fact well sexually selected, whether or not they're still sexually selected. Because they might have been sexually selected at the beginning, but now they might have other roles, whether that be for fighting and things like that. So competition within males, for example. And so so that was really the main part about mate selection side with maternal effects. I just put this one slide here. This is really to talk about. The other side, the other thing that I'm interested in when I'm looking at the, the effect of this predation risk on these, these offspring, uh, these, these females, 
is when we're looking at the offspring. So the offspring, they will also exhibit behaviors. This is known as maternal effects. Or behavioral changes and changes in physiology. And we see this over time, especially in stressed mothers versus unstressed mothers. So my interest is seeing, well, how much does that, that concept or that fear of, uh, of being eaten influence the, the offspring behavior, whether or not we see changes in, well, mate selection if we grow them, but also the way that they, they move, the way that they, they choose, choose meals, foraging, things like that. So I'm, I'm interested in that, that next level. I've done a little bit of work so far. I'm still in the analysis process of that. And um, that's actually almost done as well. So I'm really excited to have some have some concrete results on the uh, on what the, the babies are doing with these females. And, uh, and so currently, the, the, the final thing is the reason I'm here in India, as I mentioned, is I'm here on the Shastra India Canadian uh, Fellowship. And uh, the idea of that fellowship is to have researchers from India go to Canada, and from Canada go to India, and share knowledge, collaborate, give talks, and things like that. I gave talks on scientific communication, I run workshops on that as well. Uh, and so really, the, the main thing is just building up those, those collaborations. And one of the other things I did here in India is do a project looking at behavior and genetics in snails. Uh, it's an invasive species of land snail in the, the Western Ghats region of India. So I was looking at how uh, and, and they come in different color morph morphotypes. And so I wanted to see essentially why some of these colors behave the way they do. They're actually not invasive, whereas other colors do. So that's the main project I'm working on here in India, in addition to giving talks, collaborating, and, and working on other projects. And, Building up this larger network because really that's that's how we work. Uh, you know, especially more now more than ever as scientists, we need to work together. Um, so I'd like to thank Professor Rao and Botney for for inviting me to Delhi University, but also for you guys for for having me. You know, we want to hear a little bit about fish and mate selection. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, there's a lot. Of, I mean, there's a lot of people here to thank, whether my lab members, my supervisors, both here and back home, my awesome undergraduate students. They were great great people to, uh, to work with. They help me on all of these things. Um, I mean, that, that, that kind of movement of information is important at every level, no matter where you are. Even if you're a master's student, you still have something that someone below you can learn from, and they have money that they can teach you too. So I'm very grateful to have them as well. I have my family. You can't not thank your family. Um, I'm here because of them, because there was some selection going on, but I asked my mom what she was thinking. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, but really, Thank you them. Thank you my funding agencies, because without them, I would not be here in India. I would not be able to do research and talk about all this really cool stuff and learn about the really interesting world that's around us. And uh, yeah, so let's, with that, thank you so much. Feel free to send me an email. And uh, I'm open to, to questions. I'm open to comments, concerns, breakfast questions, everything. So thank you very much.